I will introduce my friend Dustin. Um, he's a longtime environmental educator. He is the past president of the League of Environmental Educators of Florida, which is a wonderful um, organization. Uh, he's a conservation photographer, and he lives and works in the headwaters of Florida Everglades, right in uh, Venus, Florida. He's the director of education at Archbold Biological Station, and he builds community relationships and interprets ecological research, research for audiences of all ages. So a really great interpreter. And that's what we are, where the nature guides are all interpreters of science. So as an artist, he uses his photography to document the science and conservation challenges of the region and the people trying to solve them. So he holds a bachelor's of fine arts from Alfred University. Um, and he, as I said, he's the past president of the League of Environmental Educators of Florida. And as such, he will be putting on their conference this year. So, um, so he he's gonna talk to us tonight about Florida scrub life because he's living it and he's teaching it. He does a really awesome summer camp as well for kids. So take it away, Dustin. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, as Karen was saying, I I'm this some I'm someone with an art degree that somehow ended up with the coolest job that I could imagine for myself, which is being plunked down at Archbold Biological Station, which has a couple dozen scientists, and then visiting scientists coming from all over the place, um, and I just am immersed. Uh, in that culture and have the fun job of communicating what they're doing through nature tours, through presentations, uh, through photography, all, all of those things. Uh, and I'm very happy to be with you. I, I love the fact that we have some of you anyways coming on Saturday. It's nice to give you an introduction, maybe get you excited. And if you weren't planning on, on coming this weekend, Maybe after this, you're going to be like, ooh, it just looks so fun there. I have to make sure I, I go. My, uh, here's my plan for the talk. Want to do a little bit of what is Archbold and spend some time on that to, to give you some context for you know, what it's all about here. Um, and talk a little bit about where we are not just Archbold, but the what is the state of the scrub? What's the state of ecosystem, uh, ecosystems in Florida? Uh, I, I'm excited to share uh, Plants of the Lake Wales Ridge with you. And when we get to that section, it's uh, I'm going to go fast through it, but it's a, kind of a, a cheat sheet on 40 different rare plants in this area. But you are going to receive the PDF of this. So later you'll be able to have it. You could just print out that section if you want it. And then we'll we'll dive into just some examples of specific projects that we're that we work on here. Plants is a really wide topic for Archbold because uh, we've been studying plants for a long, long time, um, and we have it's one of the largest research programs we have here, and and we also have um, people that we um, the visiting researchers coming in for decades too. So I just picked a few of the stories here to share. And, and my favorite part is questions at the end. Old has been here for a while. We're a nonprofit, been here for uh, 80 years now. You can see we have about 45 staff. The, the part that I'm going to focus on today is the scrub part, which is around 5,000 acres, but we, we do own and operate 20,000 acres. And I'll show you a map in a second of where or where that is. But there's three main properties. The, so biological station, that's the scrub part. And that's pristine, you know, beautiful, very well-maintained habitats. Not that um, it doesn't have some influence from people. We have, we have sandy roads and things like that in there. The reserve is an area that's been... Um, degraded in different ways over time. And we purchased it in 2002 as a buffer because it's, it's 5,000 acres on, on our west side, but also as a way to study the restoration of habitats, 
which as a Florida Native Plant Society, you probably know, you know something, something about. So we can do things like, let's go and plant some native plants in there and let's see how they do. Do they survive? Are they able to um, spread? And then Buck Island Ranch is a working beef cattle operation that's 10 and a half thousand acres and it's one of the, the larger ranches in the state. If that seems strange to you that a, a conservation environmental group is also part of the beef industry in Florida, it's because we are able to um, have uh, ecological research, conduct conservation there and do education there. And when it comes to Florida, this part of Florida, the cattle ranches, uh, they, they account for around a million acres of undeveloped land. And in Florida, undeveloped land is so important for conservation. Without the ranch lands, you wouldn't have a place for the bears and the Florida panthers and places like uh, Cara Cara and, and some plants as well. So we're doing things to make ranches more sustainable but also just to try to protect them um, as they are too, because the other option is to turn them into some other kind of agriculture that's more intensive or to turn them into houses. If you're not sure where we are, here's a beautiful picture from outer space. And I love this shot because you can actually see a, a kind of a white, a lighter color, um, spine in the middle of that picture and then I'll circle it for you that's the Lake Wales Ridge it's an ancient sand island and I'll talk more about that a little bit later um, but I love that you can actually see it from outer space this is an area that has a lot of uh, endemism which means a species that are found there and nowhere else because it has a unique history and because it is different than everything around it too. So if you're, if you're specialized to live there, um, you can't just leave. If you're a Florida scrub jay and you travel off the ridge, it won't have the conditions for you. Same thing for the plants. This is our mission on the right, to build and share the scientific knowledge needed to protect the life lands and waters of the heart of Florida and beyond. We can see on that map, um, the orange blobs, the big orange blobs, that's the 20,000 acres. But all those little orange marks, those are other, other sites where we do research. So even though we actually own and manage 20,000 acres, we are working all over this other region here, which is the headwaters of the Florida Everglades. That's about a 2.6 2 million acre region. And that's the area where the water there flows into Lake Okeechobee, which is the mother of the Everglades. We are working on private lands, um, state land, federal land, military land, all over the place. So even though we are, um, you know, maybe you'd see us as relatively small with, you know, 50 people, we're not part of some big university. We actually have our, our hands in just about every pot related to conservation and and ecological research in, in this whole region. I want to talk a little bit about uh, why what we're doing is important, just to kind of set the tone a little bit before we dive into all the stuff Archbold is doing. Here's 2010 baseline developed versus protected areas in Florida. There's already a lot of red there, and we have something like a thousand people a day moving to Florida. So our population is going up, up, up. It's not like we're getting any extra room for the plants and animals. We have to figure out how to, how to live with both. Uh, if we continue, um, this, this group, Thousand Friends of Florida said, if we continue by 2070, it will look like this. So hopefully this is coming through well on, on your screens. I'll scoot back. There's 2010. I'll look at 2070 see a lot more areas filled in. This is with current trends. Um, and if you're thinking about protecting a species, uh, many species cannot persist at just one spot. They need, you know, corridors, areas to travel through. So this would be bad news for, you know, especially animals like bears and panthers. 2010, this group did a 10 ecosystems in the US 
uh, to save for endangered species that uh, climate change could, could impact. And we can see two of them are in Florida, two out of 10, Gulf Coast and the Greater Everglades. The Greater Everglades means the, the northern part that I showed you, as well as the part south of Lake Okeechobee. This one's a little bit older, 1995, but I've actually never, nobody's ever done a more up-to-date one that I've, that I've ever seen. Uh, 21 most uh, endangered habitats in the United States. And if you start taking a look through this list, you might say, these are the top 21. Ooh, I see a few of these that are, that are in Florida. And right in there, we see the Florida scrub is one of the top most endangered habitats in all, all of the United States. And, and these, other, these other areas too, longleaf pine forests, uh, grasslands, the, these are also um, in Florida and in the same, uh, same region that I've been talking about. So I'm going to flip through kind of fast here, the different areas that Archbold works in, but I know we want to talk about plants. So I, <laughs> I won't spend too long on this before I get to the plants. Uh, but biodiversity means a lot of things for Archbold. In a very simple way, it means counting what you have, how many species are there. Uh, Catherine here, that, that's a, a trap to catch insects. How many species of insects do you have? How many species of mammals, of plants? That's a base level biodiversity. And then the second level of that is what do they do? What is the life history of those organisms? And then the third level of that is how do they all interact with each other? And that's where you start to, to realize it's not, just a, it's not just about having lists, it's about pulling in the connections between all of those, uh, trying to understand the natural systems that are there. Ecosystem processes, Archbold, uh, we study a lot of endangered species, but we also spend a lot of time on ecosystem processes. Fire is, is one of our, our main uh, research areas because it relates to everything else. Um, water and nutrients are also really important. Um, fire is the number one management tool that, that we have in Florida for most of the habitats in Florida. If you, um, if you don't have fire, your Florida scrub habitat, which is what we're gonna focus in on here, that is gone. Uh, you need to have fire. And when we get to the Q&A area, I'm happy to talk more about fire. I could talk about fire for, for a long time. We, we do a lot with fire. But uh, the takeaway is fire is good. It's our friend when it comes to having a healthy habitat. Um, and it helps protect against wildfires when we do prescribed burns, which is um, what, what we do here. We try not to have wildfires because when the conditions are right for fire we're getting out there with our team we're making sure the weather is is the you know the winds pointing the right direction and all of that to keep buildings and people safe this is species um and maybe i should have gotten some plants because there's plenty of plants here we have um natal grass uh air potato those are two big ones that i that i see a lot uh, old world climbing fern but here's uh, here's hogs, which have been in Florida for you know 500 years roughly, and at our ranch, which this photo is taken at, we have between 500 and, and 1,000 feral hogs, and they are rooting up the ground, which does not look fun when it's is when it's in someone's front yard, but if they're in a sensitive ecological area, they're changing the plant communities. They're having a big impact there. If you're also wondering, like, wait, Dustin, that's not a ranch. You're photographing a natural area. If you've never been to a, a cattle ranch in Florida, this is what they look like. They're just huge natural areas with all different kinds of habitats inside of them. So there's a, there's a seasonal pond right there. In fire already. And I actually cheated a little bit on this photo because I put the picture of Alicia in there. She doesn't work at Archbold. <laughs> this wasn't taken at Archbold, but I like it too much to, to not use it. But I also put Kevin in there and he's our land manager. So he's in charge of our fires here. But we do work closely with FWC and sometimes we'll help each other out. Um, this 
uh, on the right, it was taken at Carter Creek, which is a uh, fantastic scrub area that's north of, of um, Archbold, um, 45 minutes maybe. Climate change, uh, what you're seeing here is called a carbon eddy flux tower. We're studying carbon and methane gas emissions. This is at the ranch and we have this in different kinds of pastures. So we can see, you know, if you have this many cows or you try doing different, different ways to uh, manage your land, how is that, um, how much different greenhouse gases are you producing with those different activities? And uh, fantastic project. We have, uh, I think, five of these systems set up out there. Of course, well, Karen mentioned this earlier, we, we have our education program, which is what I do. It's a small piece of the puzzle here. It's, it's me and an intern, and we also have volunteers. But we do a lot of work with the local community. We're in Highlands County. Um, in a typical year, when we're not in a pandemic, all of the elementary school students from fourth grade visit us for a field trip. Stewardship. This is about um, working with lots of other partners, helping um, like, like there's a group in the area called the Lake Wales Ridge Ecosystem Working Group that Archbold is, the main, is, is one of the leaders on, uh, helping other land managers uh, know about the research that we're doing, that type of thing. And uh, national global engagement. And on the education level, I, I, I do that because I'm in LEAF, Karen mentioned LEAF education group, but the scientists are all the time working with, with others. It's kind of the, um, the, the think globally, act locally. We, we don't send our researchers to other states to do projects or to other countries, but we are in a, on a whole number of projects where we are just one site, but that, that research project is actually taking place at dozens of sites or more throughout the US or internationally. And uh, the, this, this right here, uh, this map is showing or, um, biological field stations and marine centers uh, around the world. And Archbold does not work with all of them, but we do work with some of them. Okay, let's pull it back to the Lake Wales Ridge and start talking about some plants <laughs> that are around here. But I do need to, to do a, talk a little bit about this geology part because it's so interesting. Florida is very flat and very low in elevation. If you imagine a time scale of 10 million years, you have times when the ocean is much lower and much higher by hundreds of feet each way. And when the ocean is much higher, say a million years ago, most of Florida goes underwater. So there's been periods of submersion and then when it's, and then when it's dry. During the last ice age, which, which ended about 10,000 years ago, the oceans were much lower and Florida was something like twice the size of the landmass it is now. Um, so where does the Lake Wales Ridge fit into that? When the water is higher, it is pushing sand in. And because the ridge is the middle of the state, uh, when the ocean was the highest, it pushed sand from both sides and poof, you've got an island, a big sand dune island. Just like you have some coastal screw now, uh, some coastal scrub out there at Oscar Shear, those are sand dunes. Same thing, but the ones in the middle of the state are just older. Because they're older, they've been isolated longer, and they have more rare species than you have on the coastal scrub. Not that you don't have cool species on the coast, too. The actual sand, this, this white, uh, white sand here, is from the Appalachian Mountains, southern Georgia, slowly eroding and, and, and moving down this way, and then you know, the the water piling, piling it up. So sometimes when the ocean is lower, you have savanna-like habitats from here all the way to Texas. So you'd have some plant species and animal species that would be found throughout all of that region. But after the ice age ended, just those, some of those species got stuck in the scrub or stuck in other parts of Florida. 
So I'll show you one rare species on, I'll get to in a little bit, where the closest relative is out in uh, on the West Coast, I think it's California. And it's, it's real interesting. So we call this the little bit of the West that got stuck in the East. The ridge has um, some really great plants and it's hard to get a good number. I feel like every time I look up how many numbers of, of like interesting plants and protected plants are here, I see a different number used on every publication. But uh, this Jewels of the Ridge, Carl Weekly put out 2006, uh, identified 20 plants that were federally protected. Uh, and then that went up to 21. And the Lake Wales Ridge is less than 1% of the land mass in Florida, but it has over 40% of the federally listed species there. So it's a, it is a really important place. If you're going to build a biological field station, this is the place you would want to pick. Next section I'm going to uh, go through quickly here. But uh, you will have the PDF of this. This is this is um, a cheat sheet to rare species around here. Not all of these are at Archbold, and not all of these are federally protected. But they're all interesting species that I think every one of these you can find on the Lake Wales Ridge. Um, I didn't put this list together. I, I found it looking around that somebody, one of our plant people, put it together like ten years ago. Um, and I was like, ooh, this looks pretty cool. And I played with it a little bit. But it's a great, uh, great guide with a photo to, to these different rare species. So all the ones in green we don't have right here. Um, so like the one on the top left there, and these only have the scientific names, but that's the uh, pygmy fringe tree, which is beautiful. And we don't actually have it at Archbold. So even though Archbold is this, you know, we have a lot of bragging rights here. We don't have everything. Um, at Avon Park, there's a really nice, at, at the college in Avon Park, the South Florida State College, they have a scrub trail there and they have a half a dozen or so of these on a little tiny to 15 minute trail. So if you ever get up there, I, I recommend checking it out. As I'm going through these, just take a look. I wonder if any of these are are, are familiar to you. Maybe you've been in the scrub and seen some of these things. When we do our tour on, um, on Saturday, I don't know that we'll actually see, there might be one of these we end up seeing on, on the tour, but there's, there, there, it's not like you see them everywhere. You know, in that 5,000 acres, they're all in all different places. You'll notice mints. There's a, there's a couple different kinds of mints um, in here. Big fan of hypericums myself. Those are St. John's warts. We have, I believe it's nine species on, on our property, but these two are the, are the rare ones. I, they're, I believe they're both protected, um, if not federally, then by the state or one, one or the other. Um, the Hypericum cumicula, cumicula, I'll talk about in a minute. The Edisonianum is, is named after Edison, who did a lot of um, botanical work in, in Florida and both were paid for a lot of botanical work in Florida and traveled around himself too. He was really interested in trying to find an alternate for um, rubber, I think is what it was. Even more. Beautiful plants. And more. <laughs> We've got a <laughs> lot of cool stuff. That one on the bottom right is this Fissolata is another one that I wish we had bragging rights to at, at Archbold. I'm going to talk about it because we research it, but we don't actually have it at Archbold. Here are uh, the species we do have at the main Archbold property that are federally protected. And there's probably a couple more that are state protected that, that aren't federally protected, but uh, 28 federally protected plant species on this property. And this is helpful because it actually has the common names on there as well. Jump into some highlights here. 
that's our new director of plant ecology. Th those familiar with Archbold will know Eric Mengus, who was here for, I don't know, 30, 35 years, something like that. He retired just, um, I don't know if it was 2020 or 2021, 2021, yeah. And Aaron has been here for just like a few months, not very long. He's standing in a rosemary bald. This is a special type of scrub habitat. And scrub is, you know, has the white sand and is pretty open. There's not, there's not very many tall trees. There's a lot of um, palmetto, a lot of little oak bushes around. And this type of scrub is called rosemary bald or rosemary scrub. It's dominated by this one plant and that's what's on both sides of him. The photo that's the background photo, you can see the dead plants in there. That's rosemary too. And this is after a fire. I'm not sure how many, you know, if this is a year later or what, or less than a year, but um, fire actually does kill rosemary and you have all these skeletons, which look really cool afterwards. So why am I showing you this? It's not a rare plant, but it is a very interesting plant that, that um, if you wanna look for rare plants, find some rosemary. One thing I wanted to show this just I think is cool is the, it, when you find a rosemary plant, it's either male or female. So you've got to look up really close for their tiny little flowers to tell if it's a male plant or, or a female plant. But it's doing, it's doing something to create these big patches of sand. It is allelopathic. It is producing um, chemicals that are inhibiting the growth of other plants. And some plants, even if it's tough to live there, are able to do it. So when you're looking at this little patch here, you'll see, um, even in this picture, there's like little, little tiny things growing down in there. Some of those are rare species. And um, here's Aaron here. So we do a lot of uh, sampling, like going, going into scrub areas and keeping track of the, of the plants that are there. And uh, here's a hy hypericum. This is a little tiny hypericum. And I actually think it is the little tiny plant that you're seeing that's in the background, but there, there it is when it's flowering. So we've been surveying this since the mid 1990s um, at about 1800, uh, 1800 individual plants. So that gives the idea of like, when you're thinking of Archbold and why uh, a field station is valuable, it's because it's in a spot for a long time. To be able to track the life of 1800 individuals, about half of those are on our property and half of those are off but on, on, the, on other parts of the Lake Wales Ridge. The Eryngium um, is another one that we've been tracking. I don't know the number on that one, but we've been tracking since the 1980s. And both of these are federally endangered species. They're both only found on the Lake Wales Ridge. I love this picture here. Uh, I said I was going to talk about Zisyphus, but um, also I, I can't really not mention Stacy here, who's who this was a few years ago. So now her little boy is like four years old or something now, um, who was doing field work almost right up until she she gave birth to her first son, first child. And this mess, this tangle that's around her that looks about as ugly as a plant could look is one of the rarest plants that in all of Florida uh, or the world even. It's, a, it's super rare, the Florida, the Florida Zisyphus. Uh, it is very narrowly endemic onto the southern part of the Lake Wales Ridge. And you can imagine that if you were clearing land, you probably would have cleared this because like, you know, that's not helpful if you're putting cows out there or, or whatever. Um, and it seems to be in pastures. This species is so rare that um, when it was when it was um, discovered, they thought it was already extinct. <laughs> so they found it in um, they found it in a drawer. I think it was the University of Florida, but don't quote me on that. Found it in a, in a herbarium in like the early 1980s or something, and the specimen was 40 years old, and no one had ever seen another one. And they're like, oh my gosh, you know, the Lake Wales Ridge is so crazy with, with this stuff. And they assumed it was extinct. But then a few years later, they started finding more.
They haven't found many, but they have found a few more. So there's a few, a couple of problems here though. Um, a lot of these are in pastures, they're on private land. So they're, they're, these homeowners could bulldoze these tomorrow and there'd be no, wouldn't matter. Being a federally protected plant does not help you on, if you're on private property. There's not much fruiting happening in the wild. Um, most populations are uniclonal and self-sterile. So what that means is when you're looking at all these clumps here, that was all for, from one seed. That seed, I don't know how old that seed was, hundreds of years ago, uh, I'm just assuming, but one seed grew all of those. And they're not able to um, uh, pollinate themselves. So you just end up with these, you know, one over here, a couple miles away, there's another one. They can't fruit because they can't pollinate themselves. So what Archbold's been doing with other with other groups, um, a big player in this is Bach Tower Gardens in, in Lake Wales, is taking cuttings, growing them at Bach Towers, getting fruit, um, and then growing the seeds. And Archbold will go and plant them on conservation lands and then keep track of them. This one here is at a private site, uh, a, little, a little tiny ranch in uh, just south of Lake Wales. This is the only one I've been to. Oh yeah, and their flowers are really small. <laughs> Look at that flower. There's Mark Darup. He will be, uh, him, and, uh, him and I will be doing the tour on Saturday. And uh, if there's a lot of people, maybe we'll break, break up in half. He has been an Archbold for about 40 years. He actually retired a couple of years ago, but he's, he's still here. He still works a couple, like three hours a day. Um, doing whatever it is, whatever he wants to do, because he doesn't have to go to meetings anymore. And he has been slowly adding to our insect collection. We now have over 150,000 insect specimens collected, not just from him, but over 150,000 insect, insects in our collection. Um, and he was do, adding something like, five, I think his average was like 5,000 a year he was, he was adding. Today, we also have the ability to digitize all of these. And a lot of our um, observe, a lot of the times when insect was collected, there'd be an observation. It was found on this plant, like on this flower. So what we did uh, in 2017, some of uh, Mark with two of our interns, our research interns, they used this new open source program to take thousands of um, data points of this, this insect visiting this flower, this insect visiting that flower, and create this visualization. Uh, just, just amazing to see the relationship between the plants and the animals. The green nodes, the green blobs, those are the plants. And then the other colors are different kinds of insects. So you can see that some plants are much more popular than other plants because some plants are visited by hundreds of insects and other ones are not. This is the same, the same project. They thought, oh, let's compare two plants and see what time of year different insects are visiting them. And let's see which, um, you know, how the network itself works. So we have blueberries, shiny blueberries on the left and uh, Pelophoxia fei on the right. That's the, the plant in the photo there with Annika. Um, and we can see there, I think it's seven species of insects that are visiting both flowers. Remember in the beginning, I mentioned biodiversity is not just about knowing what is out there. It's starting to learn how the systems work. So when it comes to plants, um, you, you know, knowing all your rare species and stuff is, is, is great. But what we really want to do is dive down and start to start to understand all of these connections. And what happens if, if one of these plants is lost? We don't know. Uh, well, what we do know is the systems are so uh, complex that you could not reinvent them. If you wanted to go to Mars and rebuild the scrub or any habitat, it's just not going to happen. Abe and Chris, 49 years in the scrub. So Abe has been coming down here since 1972. He's a professor, he's just retired a little while ago, but. He was a professor at Bucknell University. So that's his wife, Chris. And I don't know if she was here like his first couple of years or not, 
but she's been coming with him for decades as well um, and is his uh, his assistant out, out in the field. And he has looked at all kinds of things with fire and saw palmettos. And the, on the left, he's carrying a tray of oak galls. So when, you, when, when we walk around in the scrub uh, on Saturday, we'll see that the oak trees a lot of times have these little growths on them. And we have around 80 different species of wasps that make these oak galls. So that's one of the things he's interested in. I wanna, I'm gonna focus in though on uh, saw palmettos because he has done a lot of work on saw palmettos and published all kinds of cool stuff. So one of the first things um, that he did with, with saw palmettos is over, I think, it, I think it took about 20 years before they published on this, was figuring out how, uh, how uh, much they grow in a year. And so him and his team measured hundreds and hundreds of saw palmettos each year. And after about 20 years, they were able to say that they grow about a half an inch per year in Archbold conditions, uh, 1.2 centimeters. Now, if, if you have shade on, on a saw palmetto, they'll grow faster. If you have fertilizer, if you have water, they'll grow faster. So sometimes you might see saw palmettos that are growing up and that like look really long, it doesn't mean they're that old because they're growing way a lot faster than one that's in a just regular natural scrub conditions. So he would find some though that were hundreds, you know, you'd measure the alligator back on, on the salt palmetto and it would be you know, you know, this long and it's a couple hundred years old. That was only the first part of the story. In 2011, um, his, uh, Takahashi and, and Abe and others were really like, we need to use some, um, we need to get in there with genetic sampling and really figure out how old these are because saw palmettos split, they're clonal. They split and they keep growing, they split again. They're, it's like, they seem to be immortal because they never found any that died of natural causes. It's, it's even hard to kill a saw palmetto. What we have here is, um, you see it's labeled there gannet one through five. A gannet is a group of uh, plants that are from the same seed. It's a clonal group. And I'm gonna pop another one up that'll make this make a little more sense in, in a second, put another picture up. But So you can see they, they put 20 by 20 meter area. They took a little sample and they did a paternity test to see who was related to who. And they found five different clonal groups in this area. And then they, this is the one that was the biggest. So they used some, uh, some little bit of guesswork trying to connect the dots and think, okay, how, like how old is this? Because we know it's only growing this much a year, but if we do the connect the dots, we can see that this plant is way over here and way over here. So let's assume, we're gonna be conservative in our estimate, assume that uh, it starts in the middle. It has to get out to the end. If we do that, how old is this? And, and they did that for, for a number of these. The average age was around 5,000 years old. And this one, the oldest one, was around 8,000 years old. When you're looking at a saw palmetto, the material you see is not 8,000 years old, but the uh, seed that it grew from may be 5,000, 8,000 years old, maybe 10,000 years old, because this project only looked at what was inside the 20 meters. Could this same uh, gannet here have continued growing past this? Yeah, totally. Kind of blows, blows my mind a little bit. <laughs> I've known about this for like the whole time I've been at Archbold, like nine years. Still, I find it pretty amazing. Um, the last thing I wanted to do is talk a little about fire. I know I've talked about it a little bit already. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to reshare. So give me one moment here. And now I'm resharing. And um, I will assume that it's, that it's all working. And what you're looking at here is a uh, 360 image uh, that I took out in an area that 
had burned recently and I can turn it up and look at the sky, see the clouds. I can move it down and look down in my, um, the myth of the magic te of technology, my feet are not even here, but um, there's the ground there. So here's Paul Meadows. And when I say that he's measuring, you know, he's measuring the half an inch part, look at how long some of these are. After a fire, you can see this really well, right? Some of these are really long. Uh, and then the clonal part is that some of these are the same plant. They're, you know, they're budding and, um, and connected underground, or maybe they're so old they've lost those connections. Uh, you really can't talk about the scrub without talking about fire. This is what it looks like. Oh gosh, I wish I had written down the date. Let's say two months <laughs> after a fire, something like that, three months after a fire. It doesn't take long to until uh, the green starts coming back and you can see grasses and grasses in here. Maybe, actually, maybe it's even earlier than that because I'm not seeing any of the oaks really pop up yet. Uh, this, this, 3D te this 360 technology is a new thing that we've been playing with at Archbold for education and are working on a whole uh, set of these for elementary school kids, actually. So it'll be a virtual tour of all the habitats in the area. And while they're doing these, they'll be able to click on interviews with their scientists and stuff. I'm pretty excited about it. I am going to stop sharing that. And, um, and that's about it. I think timing, we're right around 40 minutes too. So I would love to see people's videos pop back up and take some questions. Thank you for being with me on that journey. And hopefully got you excited about the Florida scrub and want to come visit Archbold. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. So go ahead and um, either raise your hand. We can um, turn your, you can have your video on and ask a question directly, or you can type your, your question in the chat. And uh, while folks are thinking of their questions, any hands up yet? I'll look at participants. Not yet. I will ask one. That Florida Zisyphus, that is just so amazing. You said you'd only seen one, um, but no, there I'll, are. Yeah. Yeah. And they're mostly, and I had heard that as well. They're mostly in pastures and you have to kind of fence. They fence when they can to protect them from the cows and stuff. Well, the, so I, I mean, I've seen them. Um, if you go to Bach Tower, they have a, a rare species, a Lake Wales Ridge section. They're not growing wild that, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they planted them there. That's really uh, super cool. Uh, that'd be a great trip for your group to do. Um, then maybe try to get somebody there to be a presenter for you because they're doing the propagation of some of these rare, rare species. Um, at Archbold, I've seen many, many, many little pots, hundreds of little pots of them that were you know, being prepped and ready to go out and, and, and get planted. But that's the only place I've gotten to actually go and see them in, you know, in the field. And it was somebody with, I don't know, maybe it was 10 acres, you know, a little, little ranch. And at the back of their ranch is a little bit of a hill and these were growing there and they chose to put the fence around it. It's their private property. Mm -hmm. And they did it to, because they wanted to protect the species. They weren't forced to. Uh, so right, right. a lot of this conservation was with these, um, particularly with, with uh, Zisyphus really does rely on private landowners just wanting to be good stewards. Mm -hmm. So how did they find the Zisyphus that are on these private lands? Did they put the word out that they were looking for it or did they go searching? Do you know? Don't, uh, that is a good question. I don't know because like I said, it was in the, I don't remember what year it was, but in the eighties where they were, where they found the specimen and then they started popping up and they still here and there will find, an, uh, we'll find another one. At this point, I don't know the exact number. There's something like 10 populations that wow. we're aware of. Wow. Um, 
And that's it. That's it. And remember, they're 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 clonal, so you, you see it, and it's like, oh wow, look, there's a whole field of these. It's just one plant that you're looking right. at. Right. Very cool. Plants are incredible. One thing that I've learned is that um, many more plants are are clonal than I had any idea when I when I was growing up. I had, I had no idea. And in the scrub, it seems like this the winning strategy. Uh, especially I, I think fire is part of it, but probably because there's low nutrients in the sand here too. So you don't go big and showy, you go slow, you know, it's slow wins the race. And when the fire kills everything on top, you're ready to pop, pop back out. Cause we have four scrub oak species and they all do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, now other species will have other fire strategies. So the I forgot to say it, but the rosemary ones I was showing, the rosemary and the two other, the two other species, the hypericum and the uh, oryngium, they all die from fire. All three of those totally die from fire, but they um, have a bunch of seeds, you know, hanging out, ready to go, pop back up. But they still need fire, <laughs> so that's the weird thing. They still need the conditions that fire creates. So if you take fire out and the area gets overgrown, those species are gone. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's kind of a hard concept sometimes. It's like, yeah, we're going to kill them, but we need to, to keep them alive, to keep the species going. Well, Dustin, we actually have some questions. Uh, Julie Morris is asking, what techniques does Archbold use to manage hogs? Oh, goodness. Well... Hogs are, are pretty smart. So uh, I would like to say we put up a fence and they all can't come to Archbold's, but uh, that doesn't work very well. They, so there are some here in the scrub, but they uh, in the scrub part, there's not many because they don't like it. It's dry and not so fun for them. But at the ranch where there's a lot of wetland areas, there's tons of them there. And um, there's not a lot you can do, but try to catch them or kill them. So we do put traps out and I don't know, I think, I think from year to year, they're more active with the trapping, but I remember one year they were really active with it and they caught 200 or so that year. And we'll either sell them and make make a little bit of money off of them to a game farm or we'll euthanize them. Um, You know, selling them to the game farm is nice because you get some money, but it also feels like, okay, we're, just they're still there like they're just going to break out of the game farm and come back Mm um we had years ago six years ago or something i remember there was a a group that was talking to all the landowners in the area that said we can get rid of them but all of the landowners in the area have to be a part of it because if we wipe them out from just your ranch a year later they're going to be back from the ranches next to you and what they wanted to do is fly around and helicopters or something and just like shoot them all and it didn't didn't happen i don't know all the different reasons why it didn't end up happening but um had a project at the ranch where we had exclusionary fences and it was a plant project i don't remember what species they were looking at but it had um i think it was like four different plots but in one one big fence around it maybe little fences inside and and after almost 10 years, I think it was, hogs broke in. And then it became a study about what happens after hogs break into your experiment. And so that was, that was great. They had 10 years before the hogs, and then they were able to do it after the hogs. And so we have been able to see the, they do, they change, um, they change the, the plant communities. They also know exactly what they're looking for. You You can, you can see, that they'll go right for the areas that have the, have the good stuff that they like. Um, one one um, plant that they like is red root, which is a native species, but they end up uh, farming it because they're going around chomping right. through and, and, and all of that. They actually are, are, are spreading the red root. It's native, but they're, they're being, being farmed by, by the uh, invasive species, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, we've seen that when we've gone on hikes in areas. It likes the wetter spots, right? The, the red root. Yeah. And the hogs spread it out. 
Uh, one positive, if you call it this, if you're trying to look on the bright side, is, uh, well, two positives. One is the Florida Panther likes to eat hogs. And the Florida, the Florida Panther needs all the help it can get. So mm -hmm. hogs everywhere is, is a good food source for them. The other one is it's a nice common ground for the hunting community and the conservation community, because you might have an area that has um, been protected and the local people are pretty angry because they hunted there for the last hundred years. Their families always hunted there. And now, now it got bought out by some conservation group and nobody can go in there. Well, maybe that group can still organize some hog hunts uh, once or once a year or a couple of times a mm -hmm. year. There's an area around here. I won't go into it because I don't want to drop organizational names because we're getting recorded. <laughs> There's an area like that around here. And what they did is they would organize youth hog hunts. Um, and they would bring me out some, I spent a few years, but they'd bring me out to do an hour of, of local educate, you know, ecology, uh, ecology education for a weekend hog trip. So I think there's a really nice common ground there. Um, they can, we don't want them so much killing the bears, hunting bears, right? but you can hunt every, every hog out there uh, and you'll never run out of hogs. So you can go for it. And, and lastly, we have, uh, oh, no, there's two more. Jay Mack asked, uh, how often do you burn? And is there a schedule that you follow? Well, Archbold, uh, I had mentioned that burning is a really important part here. So we have, a, we have a fire plan for the whole property. And its property is divided into uh, fire management units. And they range in size. And I don't know the exact sizes, but let's say, 50 acres to, to 200 acres or some, somewhere, you know, in, in that range. And um, depending on the plant uh, community that's there, they have a different fire interval. If it's a Florida scrub, that's, that's about 10 years, around 10 years. And we don't, we're, you know, with fire, it's never perfect. So you maybe you get it the year before nine years or you get it 11 years or oops we gotta wait till 12 years but you're aiming for around that year so so every year we have a new map that comes out that's color coded that shows which areas need to be burned which ones are due are late to be burned all of that and then you hope that that the fire team gets to all of them um because you can only do it when you the weather is right so you can't do it every day um if you're in a habitat like um the longleaf pine forest or a um, prairie area in Florida, those burn much more frequently every two years, three years, because it's, it's grass on the ground and palmetto, they grow back real fast. It's, it's uh, a smaller, it's a lower intensity fire because, you know, grass goes um, and you can burn it all the time and you have to actually. The scrub with, uh, it takes a little while to build up the fuel. There's all those patches of sand. Um, but historically we think about five to 30 years from lightning would have been uh, the scrub interval. We go for that 10 year as a sweet spot, partly because of the scrub jays. When we look at scrub jays, we can see, as we've done research on this, um, after you have a fire, the, the scrub jay family groups go up, up, up to about 10 years since a fire. After 10 years, it starts dropping back down. It's like a real obvious little pyramid. And once you hit 20 years since fire, there's almost no scrub jays. You burn, boom, 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 goes right back up again. And so we hit it at about 10 years to maximize scrub jays. Uh, but we also do patchy burns. Not everything is a scrub jay. So the, the, we, the, the land manager doesn't want to make sure, doesn't want to burn every single bush in that 200 acre fire area. Puts the fire there and nature kind of, I mean, you're con kind of controlling where it goes, but if an area doesn't burn, leave that. So you have little refugee, little refuges, refugia, here and there and there and there. And then maybe there's a plant or something in that spot that likes it every 20 years. When you come back in 10 years, it'll be their sweet spot. So having patchy burns is, is really important and mimics a more natural fire.
On the note of natural fire, Alison Bishop asked, if there is a natural fire, is it started by lightning? Uh, if it's started by lightning, do you let it burn? Not really. I mean, I think it's a case by case situation and I wouldn't be anywhere near being able to make those calls, but just from trying to like see what I've observed here in the nine years I've been here, it's very rare to have a lightning uh, started fire. And I'm trying to remember if we've had any in the nine years I've been here because we're always burning things. So we don't get them. Um, we've had la last year, maybe it was the beginning of it was last spring we had a, a fire started from the railroad track a spark mm. and so that wasn't natural fire but it was you know one we didn't mean to to start and we were having um some kind of uh staff party and i was about to leave my house and drive down and my intern was like um i think the party might be canceled we'll have to go and get our gear and go take care of this fire and try to put the fire out and here, you can, if you work here, you can get trained and be a part of the fire crew. So whatever your job is here, you can be, you can be on the fire crew. So um, we generally will, will put them out because you want, you, we want to know, you know, where the wind is blowing and, and all of that. You don't want them to get out of control. But I know of, it's so rare that the times when it's happened, people still remember. They'll be like, oh, back in 1995, there was that lightning fire. And it burns through, you know, 600 acres or whatever. I'm making this up, uh, but <laughs> burn through 600 acres. Uh, and then they'll use that as an interesting research, um, you know, moment because they're measuring all of those areas and they can see, well, we wouldn't have burned that big of an area, but how did it affect the Florida scrub jays there? Did any die? Did like, what, what did we see? So everything here is an, is a, an opportunity for research. I can add to that um, because I was at Duet Preserve last weekend and we asked that very question of the ranger out there. And Duet is 29,000 acres in the northeast corner of Manatee County. And they have um, 4,000 acres of scrub, but they also have pine flatwoods and prairie and um, they do get lightning strikes. And I asked the question because I know in the past, Florida Forestry, who, who is really in charge of all the prescriptions, when you write a prescription as a burn manager, it has to be approved by the Division of Forestry. They don't like wildfires. So they will come out if there is a strike. But at Duet, over the years, they've built up a reputation that they can handle it. And so they will... Um, if they if forestry is notified, they'll call and 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 know if, see if they need help. But they will allow the rangers, the the land managers in Manatee County, to handle that fire on their own. And they'll go out and watch it. If, and they've got fire lines, and they burn so frequently, like you say, that it it can it can burn, and they can just watch it. So. In, a, in an area where they don't have the management, like on some of the swift mud lands where they've cut way back on their land management, forestry will come right out and put it out. And they've damaged some Bach Tower plantings to get to a, a wildfire, unfortunately, because they were in the same area. So land management is so important to keep the land management going. Um, and it's, it's sad that it, and Swift Mud, when they had the 08 crash and they cut all their land managers, they never replaced them. So, so story of fire is about good management. Yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, I didn't mention that, but yeah, the same experience here. You know, we don't want to have the state come out. They have, they have, this isn't a criticism on them, but they have to use a heavy hand mm -hmm. because the fire, it's normally, you know, wind would take it to a fire break an area you've prepared that that's not going to burn but if it's just going where it goes they have to come in and just make their own fire break right, right. bulldoze right through there uh and oh you don't you don't want that to happen yeah yeah um we have two more questions if we could get the a quick answer because it's past the eight uh that's but okay it is okay. Okay. Uh, Jay Mack asked, is there a master list of all endangered and threatened native plants and the area of the state where they grow in Florida? 
haven't seen that exact thing, but there are versions of those types of things. I gave you one on in this PDF, but it doesn't have all that information. Uh, the state has a list of all of the, you know, the, the species. It's and uh, the, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission puts out a list. It's not just plants, but it'll have the other species too. And it won't be just the ones they protect, but it'll show their federal listing too. The Archbold website, we have a list on ours, but it's just what's on our property. Um, so I, I feel like you have to do a little bit of work to actually like pull a little bit from this list and a little bit of that list. That would be, that would be a nice resource to have. Actually, they don't want locations. If, in fact, on iNaturalist, maybe Sean can, um, can pop in on this. They're telling folks on some places not to put the location to keep it private so that researchers see it, but to protect the plant population. So that is a, a concern. Uh, if, if a species on iNaturalist is, I believe it has to be federally listed, it will automatically disguise, you'll know it's in a general area, but it'll disguise it to a certain, ah. I don't know how far out it goes. Mm -hmm. If it's only state protected, they probably don't do that. I mean, that's something that we've worried about here for sure. Mm -hmm. And if you have, you know, like a ghost orchid or something, you know, we don't have that on our property, but there's people that would be out there in a second to snatch right. that up. But we do worry about things like indigo snakes. Um, Julie Morris asked, uh, how are Archibald plants and animals responding to the warmer climate? Good question. Okay, well, I only have 30 seconds left. I'll just <laughs> explain uh, all the climate change stuff. Um, I think there's a couple of ways to answer this. One is that the Lake Wales Ridge is not, because of where it is, is not warming. And it's so interesting. We had a, a guest speaker here a few years ago that was a uh, climate modeler. And she showed all these awesome maps of Florida and you know how much they could predict of what was happening in the future. Um, and then you get to this part of Florida and it's just like, question mark. <laughs> it's hard to predict in the middle of, the, of a peninsula. And I don't know if the Sandy Ridge is part of it, but there's a lot we don't know. Um, and with climate change, it's not that every part of the, uh, or with, with global warming, it's not that every part of the earth gets warmer, other parts could get colder. So uh, we don't really know on the ridge what is going to happen. There's a lot of worry because if, um, if there is a real big change in temperature, there's nowhere really to go. If you're, you're, they're stuck on these bridges, they have to live there. So if, if, so if it got too cold or too hot and they had to move, what would happen? Um, it's, uh, so we don't, we don't have answers. Nobody that I'm aware of has done any research on taking these plants and putting, or, or whatever species and, and seeing them at different temperatures, how it would work. And I don't know of any areas where we'd have a natural version of that where you can check, like you can do in the ocean, you can go to an area that has a lot of um, acidification in it, you know, and see what the rest of the ocean might be like in the future. Um, plants here are used to a lot of heat, that's for sure. Now, when you have extreme weather, like hurricane events, that does have an, a big impact. So our, um, our guy who studies uh, uh, ground burrowing wolf spiders, he has been studying for 50 years. And after Hurricane Irma, he saw a lot of them were flooded out and died. They came back, you know, I don't know how many years it took for them to come back. And that's a natural thing, but you need enough natural areas that some parts are flooded, some parts aren't. Okay, most of these got wiped out, but there's other protected area here. And then they re, you know, recolonize that area. And that's naturally what would have happened for a million years. Um, so you could have, you know, if you had a ton of hurricanes, what effect would that have? You know, who knows the, 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 so I think there's a lot of question marks. We really do not know. Um, and it's way outside of my expertise to be like trying here because we don't have the research, we don't have research projects on it. Um, what we are aware of is, uh, this idea of coastal blight inward flight. 
So as insurance rates in Miami on the coasts go up due to flooding or insurance companies uh, predicting flooding in the future, we expect to see people from the coast moving more inland and, and there's already pressure, development pressure, but on these rural lands in, in the middle of the state, there's not that many people and, and it's protecting a lot of green space. So there's already a lot of pressure for ranches to sell their lands to developers. And that's just continuing. Mm -hmm. So if you go out 50 years or a hundred years, what is the coast going to look like? Is it going to be like Orlando just radiates out down the whole center and it's all developed? So Archbold is very aware of that, very much trying to get protected. What we can, you know, in the next decades, uh, knowing that if it's not protected in that time period, it will, it'll be gone. I mean, it'll just be gone. On that Aaron. note, there is a question by Amy. Um, she says, if there is an innate endangered plant on private land, like residential, et cetera, are they still protected? Or what type of land do they need to be on in order to be federally protected? Such a weird thing to me that plants, even when they're endangered, even when they're endangered, aren't really protected. Like, okay, it's endangered, but it doesn't, there's no fine if you if you do it. Now, if you're um, if you're going to put in a new high rise or something and there's endangered plants there. I'm not sure how that works. Um, Lake Wales Ridge is the first time that a national, um, I forget exactly how, the, how they term it, national forest, forget, has been created based on endangered plants. So up and down Lake Wales Ridge, there's multiple plots that are part of this national land. That, and that was put there because of the plants and that's the first time that's happened. So it doesn't mean nothing, you know, being, being protected, you might get money for research on them. Um, it might mean that that land ends up getting um, prioritized when the state or the federal government is going to buy conservation land. Um, but for your regular homeowner, having an endangered species plant on it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Um, so here, you know, we'll drive around and you'll see it's all, you know, housing developments or citrus groves here. And you'll see house, 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 undeveloped plot, house, house. And as you drive by, you'll see like, just from your car, I'm like, there's a, there's an endangered species that only grows in about 35 mile strip here in Highlands County and a little bit in the Polk County. And it's just sitting there. It's going to get mowed the next time the county comes and mows it or whatever. I'm just, and they're just there. And, and the local people don't know. I mean, unless you get into this stuff, you would just do some random plant, you know? Good question. Cool. Yeah. I've learned so much today. <laughs> this yeah. has been great. Um, and uh, regarding the field trip, we, we still have openings. Is that correct, Karen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And on that note, our... Would, it, would you consider it kid-friendly? If anybody here has a kid. No, I, um, I guess it's up to Karen how she wants, how you guys normally do that. Well, but I'm definitely gearing it for adults. It's not the same tour I'd give for kids. Oh, okay. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. Um, and with right. that and said, you... kids are welcome on our tours, but they, it is an adult tour. So they do have to, you know, Fair if they're enough. interested and, um, you know, we had Liz Gandy's little guy when he was like 18 months old, traipsing along with us. So it just depends on the kid. Okay. Just worry, be worried that they'd be bored. Right. But okay. Right. That's that'd be the only thing, and it might be that we're out there in the heat too long, and you'd need to come back mm -hmm. to the learning center and wait for the rest of us. That kind of thing. Fair enough. Um, for those of you that haven't signed up, if you're interested, um, you can find that on our website. And like Karen said, there's multiple parts. There's our sign up and there's the, is it a waiver? Is that correct? Yeah, and there's a link within our form that takes you to their form. And if you would please remember to come back to our form, that would be great. But um, Archibald is, is going to send us the full list um, that they have. So we'll We'll get with you all, everybody who registers probably on Thursday with final directions for Saturday. Okay. Um, Dustin Angel 
this has been fantastic. I'm very grateful that you were here. Um, speaking for myself, I just learned, like I said, so much. Now I, 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 I want to go to the center of uh, Florida. Um, look at things. So um, I wanted to mention one thing. So we, Archbold got the 2015 Native Plant Society Landscaping Award for the building where I am with landscaping around it. Oh yeah. But I have, uh, uh, just be aware, we have not had volunteers to do landscaping for two years almost. It is, fr and I'm just, I keep thinking like all these Native Plant Society people are gonna get out of their car and have a heart attack or something and just leave um or the, so the weeds the hiding weeds, right <laughs> amongst it's it's all in the tall grass all <laughs> pink and tall grass you might think it's even pretty maybe but underneath that hiding are native plants and once we get on the trail we'll be away from all of that as a garden keeper i know exactly what you're saying and um we've been fortunate that we've We've had um, a lot of, in the last two months, we had some really dedicated folks that reworked our one acre. So um, totally get that. Um, I do wanna make a couple announcements. Um, in addition to the field trip next week, um, the following weekend at Thanksgiving weekend, we'll be having a field trip at the Gopher Trail at Lake Manatee State Park. So that um, somehow got missed in our in our letter. So we'll, we'll be sending info about that, um, our annual Thanksgiving walk. And then our December holiday party. So our meeting um, next December, our, in December, our regular date, which will be um, December 20th, we're gonna be live and in person at the Celery Fields Nature Center. We'll have our potluck dinner outdoors. If it's warm and if it's cool, we can be indoors um, with doors open and um, we have new scrubbers and air purifiers in there. So it's gonna be a, um, a fun first time together in a long, long time. So I hope some of you can join us. All right. So thanks so much, Dustin. Um, we're getting a lot of um, info and our thank yous in the chat as well. I know that everyone enjoyed this program and um, I hope we get a lot of um, great, folk, great folk. I know we will have at least, um, I know we have at least 15 and probably get close to the 20 mark for the, the uh, field trip this weekend. If you haven't already signed up, find the email that we sent on Sunday and check it out. All right. Thanks all. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, Dustin. It was great. Thank you. All right.